Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was I here to talk to you about? Uh, or rather, to my posterity about. Honestly, I don't recall. I'm just listening to some Jason back here. Uh, sorry, my brain fog is getting pretty severe, is it? Or am I just using that as an excuse because um, I'm kind of failing it on the script at the moment? Well, that's a possibility, too. <laughs> I'm really not sure. Um, okay, I should bring you up to speed in terms of uh, the cam health thing and <laughs> ended up having to do this um, because it's a bit of an imperative if you're going to do a series on mental health that you um, do it when it's important to do it and that's when you're experiencing things, right? So. train of thought thing again. Boom. Away it goes. Uh, okay. Um, now, I do have a staph infection, a persistent one. <laughs> this is warfare taking place. My blood is poisoned. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing new. Um, I was, after all, emptified in the early 80s. <laughs> oh, boy. So, old soldiers. That sort of thing. Uh, gee, what can I tell you? Um, apart from that, uh, the doctors observed that I was remarkably fit, uh, and that um, my musculature, what there was, because I was thin as a rail, of course, uh, was very nicely defined. <laughs> they uh, were particularly impressed with them. Um, how intact my body is. That is, the body of a young man, in, in a sense, the body of a 20-year-old, that's true. I didn't have this problem with my legs right now. Uh, I could run swiftly and for a good distance. That's the one thing that I used to enjoy doing when I was a teenager, was I was a distance runner. Uh, but I was also an excellent sprinter. Uh, triple jumper, long jumper, you name it. Uh, anything to do with running, and I really liked running fast. Uh, sprinting, that was my real trick. Uh, I was an excellent sprinter. Uh, but the thing that I was really good at was long, long distances. Uh, because I would sprint off uh, ahead of everyone and then just kind of, you know, pace myself, run at whatever speed I wanted. Uh, but occasionally break into sprints and run sprints and then, you know, back off a bit. And uh, uh, essentially, it, uh, when I was a teenager, it was running things. Uh, especially the short ones, like the 1600 or the 3200, I would consider to be a short race. Uh, I was all aces, man. I was fast. And... Um, sort of untouchable, you know, in terms of speed and, and uh, precision and ability to put on enormous speed at the end to pass someone. Uh, so, you know, I was a fast runner. And that's gone, obviously. I can't do that. I can barely walk at the moment. Uh, but apart from that, uh, my fitness level is extremely high. And notice my lungs were in excellent shape. You know, I'm a heavy smoker, but I do the exercises, right? Um, but you know, apart from that, and apart from this bloody infection, uh, my body is in excellent condition uh, and will be more excellent uh, in a few months' time after I've regained, you know, I'll be about 180 pounds or so. Uh, but it's all going to be up here, right? There's nothing going to go down here. Uh, of that, you can be sure. Uh, because I like to do hard, hard physical labor. I mean, I'm doing electronics work, and I'm building a chassis, and I do it with hand tools. The only tool I use is a drill. Uh, so everything else is hand tools. And it requires great physical strength. 
really, it does. Uh, no pussyfooting with this stuff. I mean, metal work is tough. And you know, this, these infections, all this stuff that's happened to me, well, that's because of ineptitude and the fact that I work in my bare feet and uh, two heavy transformers fell on my legs. What do you know? <laughs> Uh, so, I'm uh, sometimes a bit cavalier in the, in the work area, but the work that I do is tr tremendous precision, <laughs> I should say. Uh, don't get any ideas here. Uh, any electronics work that I do is pristine, it's immaculate. And here's another tip. When you do electronics work, use the most expensive parts you can lay your hands on. Because generally, you, you'll be in some sort of distribution arrangement where you sell the thing for three times the cost. So make that cost really high. Uh, and, you know, don't bother with preamps. Just build power as Now, preamps are brutal. Um, so much wiring harness to you is insane. It takes ages. Uh, but <laughs> my preamps were not cheap. Uh, and the power amp. As I only made, well, I made a few different models, uh, but I really wasn't in the business of selling you a power amp, no, or I, or maybe I was, uh, but no, people came to me for my pre-amplifiers, uh, the Type 121, the studios loved the uh, uh, magnetic stage, uh, it was superb for NAB, IEC, RIAA, Narda Bordo. Ortho, if that means anything to you, probably not. Uh, because this is just equalization settings, right? So it's all flexible, it's right there on the board. Uh, so you can configure it any way you like. Um, but apart from that, it's a dead silent, completely silent circuit. You hear nothing at all but the music. Uh, so, you know, people were deeply impressed with the finesse qualities of uh, any electronics work that I did. And well, the truth of the matter was, I started doing electronics work when I was a child. Um, I had an engineer for a father, and uh, he certainly encouraged me, you know, to get on with it in terms of electronics, and I did from a young age. Uh, by the time I was in my mid to late teens, I was you know, primarily working in solid state, uh, but also is restoring old tube radios and stuff like that, which I took great pleasure in doing. Um, but I was building my own bespoke electronic circuits for my recording studio. Of that you can be sure. And uh, this stuff is pretty serious because I was immediately going to 19-inch rack mount and getting these big, big panels and uh, you know, doing all the work. Uh, and then suddenly I had an epiphany and said, well, why don't I do is this in tubes? Uh, switched. Uh, came up with some designs for different stages and different purposes. Uh, and by the time I'd say the uh, 90s rolled around, uh, this studio had become so evolved and it had so many specialized circuits that I could do anything with sound, practically. And did. I <laughs> did all kinds of trickery uh, and make lousy sounding. We need more speed. We need a spinning Susan and pivot curtain. The coffin, we got three months. It feels good, it feels good by my side. It feels good, it feels good by my side. All right, so there you go. <laughs> three months. That means something. Doesn't necessarily mean anything. But it does mean something to me. Uh, that's my estimate. That I will be a productive member of society for another three months and then I'm gonna fuck off. And I don't know where I'm gonna fuck off to, but it ain't gonna be around here, that's for sure. I'm just gonna split, you know, like the Sid Barrett song? Let's split. I'm telling you, this is it. 
Okay, so you haven't heard of that Sid Barrett song. You don't even know who Sid Barrett was. Uh, but he was in a band called The Pink Floyd, or Pink Floyd, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and uh, he was their charming and erudite uh, leader uh, who wrote the songs. I want to tell you a story about a little man, if I can. A gnome named Grimble Grumble, a little gnome, stayed in their home, eating, eating, drinking their wine. He wore a scarlet tunic, a blue-green hood, it looked quite good. He had a big adventure, up in the grass, fresh air at last, whining, dining, places to go. And then one day, hooray, another way for gnomes to say, ooh, wine. Look at the sky, look at the river, isn't it good? Look at the sky, look at the river, isn't it good? Whining, dining, places to go. And then one day, hooray, another way for gnomes to say, ooh, I had to sing the whole song. Once I got going, I had to, you know, really get going. So back to Jason Beck. Shoot that thing. Chucky's on the move. Looking for a cover, but he don't touch this cover. to me. What are you doing, Jason Beck? You know, Jason Beck is truly Gonzalez. He's a megastar in the uh, European classical music circle. And his brother, Jean Christophe, uh, did the Buffy the Vampire series. Once more with the feeling, I've got to sing that song for you. I mean, Sarah Michelle Gellar, is she a hottie? But the truth in advertising is, if I was in Los Angeles, in the early 80s, I would have met the Bangles for sure, and Susanna Hobbs and I. <laughs> we would have gotten married. There's no question in my mind. I mean, I look so Jewish as it is, right? Uh, and uh, I would have come on and build you because that was what I was doing in Montreal all at the time. Uh, and I was already recording stuff prior to them doing anything, forming a band. I was doing music in 1980. Uh, so, uh, but we're about the same age, I mean, she's a bit older than me, but that, that wouldn't be a problem, you know, I've always had Jewish girlfriends, and now she is intensely desirable. Uh, the only complication would be when Michael Seal came on the scene, because Michael and I would have moved right away. But the Peterson sisters and I, we would have gotten along to I would have arrived on the scene. See you here. I gotta turn it down. I think it's overwhelming. Uh, okay, so where were we? I don't know. What were we talking about? Susanna Huffs, right? So I would have been in Los Angeles 
and absolutely certainly I would have met up with that band because I was going around making recordings of bands, uh, which is you know, what I did in Montreal and Toronto. Uh, so I would have met them, for sure, and we would have grooved because immediately I would have taken over that band's sound and um, I would have become their producer, number one, and number two, I would have become a band member. Uh, I was very beautiful, I could pass, I could pass as a woman, easily, back then, yeah, you better believe it, I was gorgeous, uh, tall, slender, I would have fit right in in a dress, um, and I would have sung, you better believe I'd, I would have sung, I would have sung everything, because I have the range, right, I can sing that stuff, I'm not going to prove it to you. I think I already have on one of my videos. If you really want to go to the chart of looking it up, let's see that happen. Okay, so I've been a bit mean. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize for anything anymore. I grant you that is just certainty. Three months. I don't think I'm apologizing for anything anymore. Get off my dick. Get off my dick, man. Bravo, yeah. Get off my dick. Do, 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 do. Okay, this is a cool one. on the bed You were dug with the good But you were never the best Did you come for a rematch or did you come for a test You left behind your smell I thought I taught you well You left behind your smell But you were always the best And the nothing is close to my revenge as I could get You left behind your smell I guess I taught you well Are we having fun yet? Three months, folks. Fuck off. Alright. So back to the script. Uh, it's going to be a 30 minute jobby today. You know, these are fairly economical YouTube videos because they're 640 by 480. What do you want? Uh, I don't abuse YouTube. I don't do that. You know, if I put up something high res, it's high res for a reason. I'm not like those guys who make 4K videos that are, you know, two hours long, uh, just to stuff as much shit down YouTube's throat as they can. I'm looking at you, Eli, the computer guy. So, <laughs> well, what can I say? Uh, Eli's a great guy, actually. He's, he's, conversations are interesting. I mean, he's very intelligent, he's quite, he's got quite the voice, he's, he really belongs on radio or television, basically he's got a radio voice, uh, so, you know, he's interesting to listen to, but his perceptions on things are interesting too, but 4K, you can do that in 640 by 480, man, people aren't tuning in to look at your dirty mug, now they're listening to you, man, they're listening to what you have to say, and they don't need to see it in 4K. So stop doing that shit. Really. YouTube has enough problems. <laughs> They're not exactly making money. YouTube is not a profit center at all. It's a big money loser for, uh, for uh, Alphabet. But Alphabet doesn't care. Uh, they're willing to underwrite this thing because they know what they're getting. 
among other things, uh, they're getting a lexicon of the 21st century, starting from 2007. And by the way, in case you didn't know this, uh, the YouTube interface, the user interface, they didn't invent it. It existed intact, uh, basically in the early 2000s in the porn industry, uh, which basically took the lead on development of anything to do with the presentation of videos. So all of the features that you get in YouTube, uh, you know, whatever they may happen to be, were baked in in the early 2000s in the porn industry interface, which hasn't changed. Um, so that's just an item of curiosity. I thought I'd throw that in there in case you didn't know. Uh, YouTube is basically using a system that was invented for another purpose by a business that basically does pretty much perfect work. Uh, and the same thing would be true in Europe where they wouldn't use the same interface, they developed their own, but the one is equally finessed and sophisticated. Basically talking about um, uh, met art in this instance. Uh, why am I talking about this? I don't know. It's basically to do with technology, I, I suppose, and the fact that uh, you know, the YouTube interface was not an invention of YouTube. Of course not. Uh, it came from elsewhere, and I just told you where it came from. Uh, so, there you go. I've got about eight minutes left of this mundaneness, so let me think, what can I talk about? Uh, I don't know. The body is alive. See, I don't really want to talk about anything entirely personal, and there is something entirely personal that's going on in my life right, right, right now, and it's become quite uh, complicated. Uh, but I, I just don't feel like talking about it. Uh, but I would hazard a guess. If I were in your shoes, which I'm not, Believe me, you have it better than me, right? Like, I'm dying here. Uh, three months, folks. And then I shuffle off. So, uh, I'm pretty certain of that. I'm, that's if I'm lucky. Because I am marginal as it is, basically. Walking down to get the mail today uh, was a burden for me to do. Man. But you got to remember, uh, no sleep, right? Not a chance. And um, likelihood that that's going to be the prevailing course of events moving forward, that I will never sleep again. Which is kind of strange to contemplate. <laughs> I do find it very fascinating, actually. Uh, because... Um, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Really. I mean, it makes no sense. Ordinary people would be wiped. But I'm fine. I'm really, comparatively speaking, rather unaffected. As far as cognitive processes go, it's not a big deal. Uh, I may joke about brain fog, but really, I don't have it at all. And, um, you know, my ability to do physics in my head is unimpaired uh, and that's a test for me uh, you know the ability to visualize say a, a, a large set and um, you know to contemplate uh, a structure of an equation I enjoy doing stuff like that in my head and visualizing it conceptualizing it maybe writing it down but chances are I won't or I'll write it on a scrap and the scrap will end up somewhere else and I'll find it two or three years ahead and go, oh yeah, look at that. I've done that with the schematics enough times and I look at the design and go, man, this is fascinating. Yeah, right. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just the way it is. Uh, the only way to really be certain of something is to write it down and maybe do a patent on it or something like that. Um, that's a pretty good way to delineate it or do a schematic for God's sakes. Um, and I've got a lot of those. 
um, you know, electronics related stuff. Really, because that's where my passion is, you know, apart from music and singing and all that. Um, my passion is electronics and building circuits. It's fascinating for me. Always has been. And um, being able to design a bespoke device, diversity tuner that is superior in every way to anything else that exists on the market today is fun. You know, it's nice to know that no one else can touch you in terms of your designs or your implementations. Right? There's pleasure in that, in being so good at something and so precise and uh, it gets noticed because everything is precision. So if I'm, if I'm fabricating a preamplifier, the first thing I'll do is I'll separate out the parts, which are generally uh, extremely expensive. You know? uh, and I should point out the one exception here. For those of you that are interested in doing electronics, just use Allen Bradley resistors for God's sakes. Don't mess around with anything. They're, they are definitely the best for audio. And if you're doing any repair work, chances are the Allen Bradleys are fine. Uh, they're moisture resistant, they're sealed, and um, they're all around good quality uh, resistors, and you should be using them because they're not expensive. Uh, as far as capacitors go, man, go all the way. Uh, use Solon or something like that. You know, use big fat electrolytics, uh, sort of big fat uh, uh, film capacitors. Um, you know, really, really go whole hog, you know, dual chassis preamplifier or something like that. You know, do, go, go Joe Rosen. Um, now, there was a guy whose systems were so uh, on the edge that, you know, you'd listen to something like Bjork and feel sick because it was that loud and that clear. It's like being at a rock concert, essentially, the like volume levels that he would listen uh, on one of his systems was just staggering. And he had these incredibly efficient speakers that had a, uh, a plasma tweeter, which you had to light or set or whatever, and you had to have a supply of gas on hand to run the plasma tweeter. Uh, but the interesting thing is, of course, it's a folded horn configuration, a, a tele transmission line, <laughs> and the thing sounds unbelievable, these speakers. I had the chance to buy them uh, before Joe got his hands on them, but I didn't want to. I think they were $800 back in the early 90s. And I just I didn't want to take that on. I was into quad electrostatics. Uh, so, but Joe got them, probably for about that amount of money. I don't know. This is one of the dealers that we did a lot of business with. Uh, because they went to high-end audio and too. So, uh, okay, we're almost out of time here. Coming up to uh, 29 minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up and say good night, Irene. And literally, good night, Irene, because that's what it's coming down to here, folks. So, uh, sweet dreams and uh, uh, pleasant what have you.